This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Schuckmark, Jr., host for Outside In. Today on Outside In and tomorrow on We Like the 1%, we're going to delve into the world of cryptocurrency trading with my guest, Anil Kumar, senior trader at ProFX Options. Aloha, Anil. How are you? I can, I, you. can I see you anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see you. Well, I can't see you, so <laughs> there you are. <laughs> now I can. So Looks you're joining like us. Morning. You're joining us by Skype in London, and uh, it's midnight in London, and it's extremely cold in London. Uh, but if it makes you feel any better, here's a lovely backdrop for you to enjoy. <laughs> and we're going to go into cryptocurrency trading today on Outside In, and continue tomorrow and discuss more about your company, ProFX Options, on We Like the One Percent. So let's kick off with a little bit about yourself. Tell us how you got into trading, why you love to trade so much, because this is one of my favorite subjects. Great. Again, first of all, aloha, and thank you for inviting me to this, uh, this great show. Uh, yeah, you're right, it is midnight. It's minus five, so I'm envious of your, uh, your temperatures <laughs> there. But it's always a pleasure um, to see you. Um, and yes, thank you in terms of uh, wanting to know a bit about my experience in trading. I've been trading um, for the last 20 years. Um, everything from futures contracts to Forex to now cryptocurrencies. So anything really that moves up and down. Um, as a trader, we enjoy kind of movement, basically. We, we like volatility. And you started off with um, FX and binary options, is that correct? Well, binary options is a much more of the past now. Yes. Uh, we focus mainly on the FX trading, Forex trading. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, is very popular in the UK and in Europe, actually. Um, I think a lot of people who enter into Forex trading, um, you know, start with an idea that it can actually make them lots of money. But as with all great challenges, you know, the journey is a journey about how to become successful at trading. And that's what we do as a company. We teach people how from very, very basic knowledge to um, making money on a consistent basis and also becoming professional, if that's what their, uh, uh, their goal and ambition is. Profix Options, we're, we're an education company based in London. And what we're going to discuss a little bit is uh, for, foreign uh, currency trading, which is at the ba basis of what cryptocurrency is trying to copy at the moment. Yeah. And uh, now when I traded about 20 years ago, there were various ways of predicting or trying to predict what might happen, whether the market was going to go up or down, whatever currency pair you were focusing on. And one of the techniques I liked, which maybe you particularly don't care for, was the Japanese candlestick charting, uh, yes. which was developed by Homma, which uh, to predict the price of rice in Japan. So this is one of the techniques, in addition to Fibonacci sequences, to Bollinger Bands, there are various techniques where people research and try to see whether they should put a call or a put. In other words, whether the market's going to go, whether that pair is going to go up or going to go down. So there is another Japanese connection recently in the context of cryptocurrency trading, and that is the introduction of Bitcoin itself, the prime cryptocurrency. So yes. would you like to give uh, viewers and listeners a little bit of a background all the way from when Satoshi Nakamoto introduced the concept of Bitcoin about a decade ago? Absolutely. Um, this is a, a fascinating topic, really, because as a currency trader, we know that traditional fiat currencies are backed by central governments and they're centrally controlled. Up until 1971, the US dollar, for example, was backed by gold reserves. But as Nixon came along and said, look, we, we want to decouple um, the, the US dollar from the gold standard, it basically became a free floating currency with no real backing uh, with any assets. The value of the currency was really pegged to the, um, you know, the, the behavior, the, uh, uh, the performance of the, the country itself. And as time has gone, has gone on, you know, less and less money actually has been backed by assets and more and more has been notional. And really what we've seen, uh, particularly since 2008 when we had the financial crash, Trust basically disappeared in central governments and their ability um, to manage financial and um, financial institutions. 
And it was really around 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto came up with a concept that a currency, it's backing, what is a currency? What is this backing? And we all understood that uh, uh, you know, fiat currency was backed by governments and their, and, and their institutions. But the notion was presented that actually the problem with having this central control was that there was no real trust left in the banking system. So a new form of trust was developed by a white paper that was produced in 2009. And the concept really was that rather than have a centralized currency, it was proposed that a decentralized currency could be created and created it was. It took a little while before the adoption of the technology of the concept of blockchain and the cryptocurrency sitting on top of it took hold. But essentially what actually happened was that a group of core programmers took on the whole blockchain concept and started to create these cryptocurrencies. At the very, very beginning, uh, the price of each currency, were, uh, the, uh, the Bitcoin, was something like 0 0.06 cents per, crypto, or per Bitcoin. And there was no real notional value uh, placed upon that currency until really about 2011, 2012, when it became apparent to people that they could actually um, transfer value anonymously. And this became very attractive to places like the dark web, uh, the Silk Road, where goods and services could be transacted utilizing this Bitcoin in total anonymity. And that was obviously attractive to that particular segment. And it wasn't really until about 2013 when uh, you know, the, uh, the governing bodies, the FBI, the central uh, uh, <laughs> governments, picked up on the fact that they wanted to close down the illicit trade. And really, by highlighting this illicit trade and the an anonymity of um, cryptocurrencies, or Bitcoin particularly, it highlighted the fact that it had value, that it had actually the ability to have anonymity. And that brought a whole new wave of people into the idea that suddenly there was a currency that could be anonymous, that could hold value, and that could be trans transferred from peer to peer. And that's really where it took off. And we still don't know, we still don't really know the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, right? He could be Totoro's neighbor, right? <laughs> totally mythical because uh, some people argue that it's not one person, that it's a yeah, group of people. A group of people, yeah. And it, is, it is part of the mythology of Bitcoin who created it. <clears throat> But the, but the ethos and the uh, and, and the deliberation of the of the white paper was that really the decentralization that nobody should actually be controlling it that it should be um, you know controlled effectively by uh, you know by by the community and that the value transferred to person to person peer to peer um, was a function of the fact that it didn't require it to go through the main banking system through institutions and I think that was what the attraction was. And the whole technology behind Bitcoin, which is the blockchain technology, and we'll talk about blockchain a bit later on, yeah. is what's really taking off in terms of um, its functionality, its ability um, to be used for other types of um, transactions, actually. So, Anil, uh, most experienced traders such as yourself have no fear of Bitcoin. You see it as a wonderful new opportunity. It's just as exciting as when email and internet came out 25 years ago. But for most people, the average person, uh, it's still something a little bit scary. And I think this is because people want to physically touch a form of money. So that old fashioned uh, idea of money is still in their head. Certainly the best money has certain characteristics associated with it. The best types of money, for example, have durability, they're in limited supply, they're accepted by a wide range of people, they're portable. Whereas Bitcoin, it's not fiat currency and fiat doesn't mean it's not backed by anything. What fiat means, it's not, nobody's forced to use Bitcoin uh, because fiat means it's by decree. So yes. uh, it, it doesn't, it, it's not backed, it, that's not the definition of fiat, it just means no one is forced to use it. So it's something entirely new in the, in the system. And one of the problems that people have with cryptos is that they lack intrinsic value, unlike gold and silver. But there are some cryptos that have 
come up in the past couple of years or so when things have developed rapidly in the past two or three years in this area that are being backed by resources. So there is, for example, a company named Digix, which is a gold-backed uh, mm. Bitcoin it's on the Ethereum network. Similarly, running on the Ethereum network just recently announced was the government of Venezuela has developed mm. their own version of Bitcoin, which is called the Petro. And uh, I think they got tired of eating their zoo animals and they ran out of zoo animals to eat. So it's time to come up with something new. And they've come up with the Petro, which is backed by the crude oil reserves in Venezuela, as well as some other natural resources and diamonds that they've got there. So uh, what do you think of the, these progressions in the crypto world? I mean, it is very interesting what's been happening in the last six to 12 months. It's, it's actually very exciting. There's been a lot of adoption by um, a lot of nations in embracing uh, this blockchain technology and the cryptocurrency on top of it. Because as you well know, the dollar is all powerful and it has an element of control and the US exerts its control. And I think part of the, the, um, the blockchain and the petro um, cryptocurrency is to break away from that pegging, to break away from um, the restrictions that uh, denominating anything in the US dollar can actually cause. And, and, and that's, I think, what is a massive change that's happening. I mean, we've got Dubai, uh, which are adopting blockchain. Um, we've got Russia embracing the blockchain technology so as we get more and more in fact iran i think has just announced that it's going to be creating its own cryptocurrency so we're going to see this more and more and more and the trend isn't going to stop and i think um, as a trader it's very interesting to us because the further we go down in adoption the more and more stable in a way things become because i think there was a notion last year that bitcoin was here today, gone tomorrow. And I think that's what created a lot of fear for people is that, you know, it, could it be stamped out? But I think what's been happening in the last um, six to 12 months is that with all the publicity, positive and negative, has brought attention to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. In London, for example, we're seeing a massive surge in uh, interest, in, interest in traditional businesses looking at blockchain as a function of their business. So going back to the Petro, you can see why Venezuela would do this because they're probably restricted in their ability to uh, you know, make use of their reserves and, and Petro being the biggest reserve they have, they're seeing this as a way of capitalizing on it. So in a, Venezuela in is another interesting uh, uh, jurisdiction because a lot of mining and a lot of people have been using Bitcoin um, as a method of, of, of exchanging goods and services. And I think them adopting a petro dollar, I think is actually, uh, you know, in many ways, a very, very interesting uh, development. And we, we're going to be watching that very closely. Okay, wonderful, Anil. Uh, before we get into the speculative investment side, which is the dominant sphere of uh, what cryptos are taking up at, at the moment, since it's not uh, fiat or it's not um, uh, a currency by decree. We're just going to take a quick break and we'll go into the investment side of it and the trading side. So we'll be right back after this quick break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. Welcome back to Outside In. We're talking with senior trader at ProFX Options, Neil Kumar. Now, 
we did the basics of Bitcoin, Anil, and we want to get into the underlying technology because there's no reason to be afraid of blockchain. There might be some reason to be afraid of ICOs. They could be frauds and scams. Uh, but we did a two-part blockchain with Professor Minelli, who was also joining us from London about a month ago. And we went quite in-depth into what blockchain is. But we're going to focus on blockchain in the context of trading cryptocurrencies with you uh, because the block size is what is important. The block size is what caused that fork, that rift between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin uh, cash, is that correct? Correct, yes, yes, yes. So what, what actually happened with that fork, if we're specifically talking about that, is that when Bitcoin was conceived, it actually had limitations in the amount of information that could be contained in that. It was limited by a certain amount of um, space. And what has been happening is that as more and more uh, people come on with uh, you know, new ideas on how to use these cryptocurrencies, there's been a diversion from the original code to expand the code. And I think Bitcoin Cash was one of the first that we saw of that. But certainly what we're seeing more and more is that the uh, uh, industries are starting to look at how they can utilize this uh, cryptography on the block size to encapsulate things like smart contracts. Smart contracts is why the expansion has been needed. And a smart contract is, uh, without going into too much detail, it's basically an obligation that a, a, a token or a currency that has a function that will, uh, through its contract, have an obligation to fulfill. Uh, it's a quite a complex subject in terms of smart contracts, but that's why we're having this expansion of uh, block size um, to allow for the facility to, you know, to make more use of it. Uh, because the issue between uh... Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash is that the blockchain developers are purposely keeping the block size small. Uh, yes. And that wasn't really Satoshi Nakamoto's original vision. It was to get more people on board to have small transaction fees. And by the blockchain developer keeping the blockchain small, you can increase the transaction fee, which is what is happening. And then the Bitcoin Cash people said, no, this isn't right. So they increased their block size to, I think, eight, eight megabytes. Is that right? So the, their transaction fees can be lower, but people are trapped in either of these two spheres. And then there are these things like Lightning Hub, I think. But I don't know how we can get out of this problem um, because both, people can have both Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash in their wallet, in their e-wallet. Yeah, there's, there's a community, isn't there? There's, there's, <clears> there, there's tr true diehard Bitcoiners who don't want any change whatsoever. And then there's the others that want to fork off and try and do different things for different reasons. And sometimes it's monetary. They want to control the forks and be able to, you know, make money for themselves. Whereas the traditional Bitcoiners are much more focused on, you know, the ethos and, and the plan for, you know, the whole idea of a decentralized ledger, distributed ledger, and the ability to do transaction and store wealth. And I think there's a divergence of these communities, basically. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing more and more. But I think the change is coming where I think it's going to become much more um, uh, uh, blockchain orientated rather than just the traditional currencies that we see at the moment. I think the functionality of blockchain is really coming to the fore now. Okay, now let's go into the possibilities of trading in cryptocurrencies. So we've got FX, the standard currency pairs in fiat money, such as pound dollar, pound euro, euro yen, these kind of trades. Yeah. And one of the disadvantages in the FX market is that it's only open five days a week, right? It's yeah. 24 yeah. hours, but it's only five days a week. Now, the advantage with the cryptocurrency trading, because it's in a virtual world uh, and it's all markets, is that it's open 24-7. Is that not yeah. correct? Sure, sure. Uh, so, when trade, so now we're getting into the sphere of you know, how to trade cryptocurrencies and how to make you know, money from the movements. That's kind of our speciality. Mm -hmm. The underlying technology is all very interesting, but what we really care about is how can we capitalize on these movements? The problem, I suppose, with cryptocurrencies is that you have three problems. One is where to buy it safely. The second is where to store it safely. And the third is where to trade it. And all these three problems are kind of unique to cryptocurrencies, whereas with fiat currencies, you know, a lot of them are in regulated markets. 
the movements are regulated, the, uh, the, the brokers are regulated. So we, we're moving from a regulated to an unregulated sphere, which adds another element of risk. But it's not a risk that should be, um, you know, overestimated. I think if you take care of where you buy your cryptocurrencies, where you store your cryptocurrencies, and where you trade cryptocurrencies, um, you know, you can actually uh, take advantage of the volatility that exists in cryptocurrencies that is less volatile in, in FX markets. And you may say, well, is volatil volatility good or bad? As a trader, we like volatility. We yeah. don't want currencies just to be going flatlining. Yeah. So that's what is, why it's attracting a lot of people into the crypto space is because they see these movements anywhere from five to 10 to 20% moves a day, where in traditional fiat currencies, we might see one or 2% moves. So we can see as traders why people are getting attracted um, to trade cryptocurrencies over and above fiat currencies. Yes, the common misconception is that, oh, uh, Bitcoin already went up to 19,000, it's dropped back to 15, now it's dropped even further, about 5,000 more. And people always tell me it's too late for me to get into it. And I say, as a trader, you never think it's too late. You get in on the pullback and a lot of people aren't aware that you can actually make money when a pair or an investment goes the opposite direction. They think it should always be going up or being green. So that's a call and that's the, play, that's the uh, kind of uh, bet you cool. place. Uh, but you also make money when the price drops. So that's a put in currency trading. So there, there is a, still a chance. It's never too late to get on an, in on it, but you want to get in when it pulls back, like it's doing now, right? Absolutely. We, we saw the markets. We saw Bitcoin particularly, you know, uh, reach almost 20,000 before December. And the reason it went so high is because, uh, you know, from sort of August, September, October, uh, you know, more and more news channels were starting to talk about cryptocurrencies. We're more and more were talking about, um, you know, these tremendous moves. There was a lot of hype about where Bitcoin could potentially go by lots of characters. And the, 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 with anything, Pauline, it's all about supply and demand. Yeah. And what happened between September and December was that everybody wanted to buy. And when you have demand and when everybody wants to buy, that naturally pushes the prices up. Yeah. And with almost every asset class, it will reach a price where it becomes too expensive. And in December, we saw that. So this natural pullback that we had was predicted by us, actually, because it, it, it needed, it shot up so far, so quickly, that pullback was absolutely natural and required. We're seeing Bitcoin around 10,000, and we started to see a bit of strength come back in again. And it's it behavior, and I, as you probably know, you know, we trade algorithms, we trade patterns, yeah. and the patterns we're seeing in Bitcoin are very, very familiar to us because the market is made up of buyers and sellers and buyers and sellers have that same emotional fear and greed element to it. So when people say to me, you know, when is the right time to buy cryptocurrencies, as you rightly said, wait for the pullbacks and it's definitely pulled back. Um, and you know, whilst I don't want to predict where it's going to go <laughs> yeah. in the markets to take advantage, as you said, when the market's going up or when the market's going down. And what it, uh, Bitcoin is usually pegged against is the US dollar. So that's why you'll see the insignia USD slash BTC. This is the code for the US dollar and Bitcoin currency pair transactions. But it is now possible, obviously, because the Ethereum network is building up to trade Bitcoin against another crypto like Ethereum. So you'll see the insignia BTC slash ETH for Ethereum. So this is quite exciting. And uh, do, do you have a preference for trading cryptos against cryptos or would you prefer to trade cryptos against uh, fiat currency? Uh, so so the, there are two elements to that question, actually. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've seen is that banks aren't particularly, particularly fond of cryptocurrencies and they've done a lot of things in the last few months to sort of um, make it more difficult, things like not allowing people to use their credit cards, which actually is a good thing yeah. to buy cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. The second part of your question really is trading one currency against the other. There are a lot of exchanges out there which don't even accept fiat currency. Mm -hmm. They allow you to uh, import your, uh, uh, your Bitcoin and then you can use your Bitcoin to trade it against other currencies, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's Ripple, whether it's uh, any of the top currencies can be traded against each other. 
uh, and that's it's trying to remove itself from the requirement to trade against a fiat currency. And it's very important. It's very important you mentioned top currencies because we advise everybody to go to coinmarketplace.com. This lists the thousands of coins that are on display at the moment. For traders, it's typically advised that they trade only the top 10 coins. So these include entities like Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin. So these are safer than hobo nickels, for example, that we were looking at. Yeah, I mean, I mean safety is, is, a, is a word that I'll, I'll just caveat because yeah, everybody yeah. should understand, you know, every type of trading is risky and you should only really risk an amount that you can, uh, you know, that, that you can risk. Yeah, because trading is not for widows and orphans, right? And it's, be pre it's like going to a casino, be prepared to lose whatever you invest in that kind I, of... I, I always tell my students that and I tell everybody that, you know, trading is risky and that they should... Uh, you know, be careful. It's not a one-way street. We saw people um, who were being uh, telling me that they bought Bitcoin at five thousand. Now it's fifteen thousand, and they were thinking they were rock stars. <laughs> but a rock star in trading is is very simple. When the market's going up, it's how you handle yourself yeah. when markets go down. And I think that's what we've seen a lot of people crying about is that they don't know how to trade it in a downward market. And that's the point I wanted to make a bit earlier on. There is a difference between investing and trading. Investing is where you would buy Bitcoin and you just hold it uh, for whatever duration you want, whether it's one month, six months, 12 months, five years. And you don't care too much about the upward and downward movements. Traders, we like the upward downward movements yeah. and we can take advantage of those um, in, in either direction, as you mentioned earlier. And with the advent of futures contracts being offered against Bitcoin, it's made it a lot easier to use hedging techniques to make sure that we can take some of the volatility out of selling Bitcoin, for example. Currently, only Bitcoin has a futures contract, but I, I can see a time when Ethereum and some of the top currencies will also be uh, trading on futures contracts on regulated markets. But let's wait and see. Let's see if that happens. And of particular interest to a lot of people are the privacy coins. Is that correct? Like uh, Monero and Zcash are doing very well uh, because people are feared fearing for their safety on the cryptocurrency platforms, aren't they? Or the cryptos themselves? Yeah, so, so there's, again, there's two elements of the question. One is um, the, the privacy of who actually owns that cryptocurrency, that it can't be traced back to them. That's one type of people that may be looking for that and may be interested in that. But in, in but the peer-to-peer -peer nature of Bitcoin, for example, if I wanted to transfer a Bitcoin to you, we could do it privately and we wouldn't need anything else to do that, yeah. Okay, Anil, thank you so much for joining us on Outside In. We're gonna continue this discussion because you're my last two-part guest on one of my favorite subjects, and we'll see you tomorrow on We Like the 1% uh, in the evening at your time, morning at 11 as usual here. Aloha, thank Anil, and thank you, and see you tomorrow. Aloha, everybody, we'll see you tomorrow on We Like the 1%. Aloha, thank you.